In this pre-calculus algebra video, we will walk through some examples of solving linear equations and solving rational equations. These examples come from our textbooks learning guide and you should be writing your work directly on that learning guide and uh, sol solving these, these problems together. You might also try to solve the equations on your own and then come back after you've attempted it and watch the video to see if you're getting the same results and using the same process. If you have another process that works for you, that's okay for solving equations, but watch the video to see if maybe there's a more efficient way to, to do the work. Quick review of solving a simple linear equation. We have 6x minus 3 equals 63. So remember that what we're going to do is work towards isolating the variable. So in this case, we want to isolate x, right? So if we want to get that x by itself, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add 3. I want to add 3 on the left so that I can get rid of that negative 3. And if I'm going to add 3 on the left and I'm going to keep this, e this equation balanced, then I'm going to have to add 3 on the right also. So 6x minus 3 plus 3 gives us 6x. 63 plus 3 is 66. Next, after I add or subtract, the next thing I'm going to do is multiply or divide. You notice that that goes backwards from the order of operations, PEMDAS. So when I'm using PEMDAS to, to evaluate an expression that has adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. I'm going to first do any of the multiplying and dividing, and then the adding or subtracting. So when I'm solving an equation, it's almost like what I'm doing is I'm undoing that arithmetic. So I'm going to work backwards from PEMDAS. That's why I'm going to add or subtract first, and then come back and multiply or divide. To further isolate this x, I'm going to divide both sides by 6. And uh, when I divide 6x divided by 6, I get x. 66 divided by 6 is 11. So the result for number 1 is 11. When I work through this example 1b, I have a little bit more work to do. Do you remember using the distributive property? Now, some of you were like, oh, yeah, that's easy. I just did that last semester, or I just did that yesterday. Uh, but it could be that you haven't used the distributive property for a while, so let me give a quick review. When we have this 3 times the quantity of x minus 1, we multiply 3 times x and 3 times negative 1. So 3 times x is 3x, three, 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. So what we'd have is 16 equals 3 times x plus 3 times negative 1, which is negative 3. And watch carefully what's going to happen with this next part. When I see this negative or subtract x minus 7, what I'm doing here is I'm distributing this negative to each part. Another way of reading this expression is to say the opposite of x minus 7. So it's the opposite of x and the opposite of negative 7. So that gives us the opposite of x plus 7. Now, in this entire problem, I'd say that the most common mistake is this getting this plus 7. So make sure you understand why I'm going to write this as the opposite of x and plus 7. It's because that negative distributed to the negative 7. Next, I can continue to simplify this. Before I start isolating anything, I can continue to simplify by putting the like terms together. So the 3x minus x, and then the negative 3 plus 7. I've just used what's called the commutative property to change the order. Of things. I've not really done anything to it yet. I've not done anything to either side of the equation, just simplifying. 
But when I combine the 3x minus x to simplify, I'd have 3x minus x. 3 minus 1 is 2, so that's 2x. And then negative 3 plus 7, that's the same as reverse the order and say 7 plus negative 3, or in other words, 7 minus 3 is going to be positive 4. It's positive because the bigger of the two numbers, the 7, is positive. So now I have an equation much like 1a, where I'll now work to isolate the x by working backwards. So the first thing I'll do is subtract 4. Now, because I'm subtracting 4 from the right-hand side so that I can isolate this x, I'm going to subtract 4 from the left-hand side also to keep that equation balanced. So 16 equals 2x because the plus 4 and minus 4 cancel each other out. And then I can divide both sides by 2 to get 16 divided by 2 is x. 2 divided by 2 is 1. So I have x equals 16 divided by 2, or in other words, x equals 8. And that's the solution to 1b. Notice what I did was I simplified the right-hand side of the equation first, and then I went back to isolate the x. When we look at number 2, this is not what we'd call a rational equation. This is still linear. Even though we have fractions here, it's linear because notice that none of the denominators are x's. But on the right, for th number 3a, we have what's called a rational equation because we have x's in the denominator. One way to, to simplify either of these types of examples is to find the least common denominator and multiply each of the three pieces by that least common denominator. What you'll see here is I've rewritten the equation, and this is a great strategy for saving yourself some time and effort. When I read this equation, I'm not going to copy it exactly as I see it. Instead, I'm going to copy it with an exaggerated fraction bar all the way across. That's all I've done, is I've copied this problem with an exaggerated fraction bar. Now, do you recall how to get the least common de denominator for 6, 8, and 4? I'm looking for the number that all three of these could go into. Now, way back the first time that we, we do this work, what we're doing is we're going to list all the multiples of 6. 3, 6 times 1, 6 times 2, 6 times 3, 6 times 4, and so on. 6 times 5. Uh, 6 times 6. And then uh, the same thing for the 8. 8 times 1, 8 times 2, 8 times 3, 8 times 4, etc. Uh, and what I'm looking for is a number that's in the, the, the list for all three. 4 times 1, 4 times 2, 4 times 3, 4 times 4, 5, 6, and you see when I do 4 times 6, I get that 24, and 24 is the least, the lowest number, that's a multiple of all three. So it looks like our least common denominator is going to be 24. 20, a 6 goes into 24 evenly, an 8 goes into 24 evenly, and a 4 goes into 24 evenly. Now, you don't always have to do this method, but if you do struggle to find the least common denominator, that method will always work. There are other methods also. Let's take our 24, and what we're going to do now with that 24 is multiply all three pieces by 24. Now, don't get carried away here and don't start multiplying yet, because I'm actually going to want to reduce before I do the multiplication. Because uh, if I've picked that least common denominator correctly, we're going to see some things re reduce. 6 goes into 6 once. 6 goes into 24 four times. 8 goes into 8 once. 8 goes into 24 three times. 4 goes into 4 once. 4 goes into 24 six times. So now what I've got is 4 times 
x plus 3. Is equal to 3 times looks like we've just got that 3 left plus 6 times the quantity of x minus 5 so if I simplify the left and the right by distributing or multiplying then I can isolate the x here's what it would look like 4x plus 12 is equal to 9 plus 6x minus 30. Don't forget to distribute that 6. 6 times negative 5 is negative 30. And then combining like terms to simplify on the left and right. Nothing to simplify on the left, but on the right, I could do this 9 minus 30. It would be negative 21 because uh, 9 plus negative 30 is 21. And now I'm ready to solve the equation. To solve this one, I want to isolate the x still. To isolate the x, the first step is going to be to put all the x's together. I find that it's usually going to be a little more efficient to subtract the smaller value of x. So I could have subtracted 6x from both sides, but I'm going to subtract 4x from both sides because the 4x is a little bit smaller. So that'll turn out being a little more efficient. So why am I subtracting 4x from both sides? Because I want to push all the x's to one side or the other. 6x minus 4x gives us a positive 2x. You notice that if I had subtracted 6x from both sides, I would have gotten a 4x minus 6x, so it would have been a negative 2x. And that's why I subtracted the smaller value, the negative or I subtracted the 4x, because then I get a positive number. And now we're just back to a basic linear equation. I could solve this by adding 21 to both sides. 21 plus 12 is 33, and 33 equals 2x. When I do this 33 equals 2x, I could divide both sides by two don't panic over that not dividing evenly you don't need to do the division to get a decimal we're going to leave this as an improper fraction 33 over 2 so don't don't do anything else to that it's best to have an exact value if you do divide it with a calculator you do still get an exact value this time but that's only because the 2 goes into the 33 evenly but leave your answer as a fraction Let's use the same process over here. Uh, our least common denominator, we've got an x and a 2x, so the least common denominator is going to be 2x. If you don't recall how to get that least common denominator, then you might go back to some review in the sections of our textbook that are labeled with a P for prerequisites, and that'll give you a little bit more review of how to get that least common denominator. But I'm gonna take that least common denominator, 2x, and multiply it by all three pieces. So did you see that once again, I rewrote the equation with exaggerated fraction bars. I can reduce this x over x, and I have an eight. 2x over 2x reduces, so we have five, 3 times 2x is 6x. Subtract 5 from both sides so that I can isolate the x. 8 minus 5 is 3. 3 equals 6x. Divide both sides by 6. And I'd get that x equals 3 over 6. Now, 3 over 6, I, I don't need to divide that. I can leave it. But I do need to reduce it. And this one, this 3 over 6 does reduce. It's not a fraction in lowest terms. So when I reduce that, I've got 3 divided by 6 or 1 half. So for 3a, we get that x equals 1 half when we simplify. Let's look at another rational equation. I'm going to rewrite the fraction again with an exaggerated fraction bar. 
So it would look like this, 8x over x plus 1 equals 4. I'm going to leave a little space because I'm going to be multiplying the least common denominator. And when we have an x plus 1 is the only denominator, makes it easy finding the least common denominator, it's going to be x plus 1. So it looks like what I'll need to do is multiply everything by x plus 1. Multiply all three pieces by x plus 1. And you see what happens, those x plus 1s divide out. So we're left with a linear equation. So we have 8x equals 4 times x plus 1 minus 8. Distributing this 4, we'd have 4x plus 4. So 8x equals 4x plus 4 minus 8. Combining like terms, I'm going to do 4 minus 8 is negative 4. To solve this equation, I'll add 4 to both Oh, sorry, that was not right. I'm not going to add 4 to both sides uh, because I didn't notice right off that we have x's on both sides. So I'm not going to um, move the negative 4 yet. What I'm going to do instead is move this negative or move this 4x over by doing a negative 4x, right? So subtract 4x from both sides. 8x minus 4x is going to be 4x. So 8 minus 4 is 4. So we have 4x equals negative 4. Divide both sides by 4 so that I can isolate the x. And it looks like we get x equals negative 1. Now, I forgot to mention this with our last example, but we've got to be really careful when we're working with rational equations to make sure that our response, our, a our answer, our x equals negative 1, fits in the domain. And when we look at this equation, remember that a fraction such as 1 over x cannot have a 0 in the denominator, right? So we can't have 1 over 0. We can't have a 0 in the denominator. Well, when we look at this example with the x plus 1 in the denominator, we can see that x can never be a negative 1 because if I put a negative 1 in, that would in for x, that gives me a 0 in the denominator. Doesn't mean that we did a anything wrong when we solved this. All of our solution was correct. It's just that at the end we have to recognize, whoops, that doesn't fit. It's what we call an extraneous, starts with extra, extraneous solution. So the solution that uh, we've solved everything correctly, we've done it correctly, it just doesn't work in that equation because if we went back and put this negative one and for each of the x's, we would get something that's undefined. We'd get something with a zero in the denominator. So this one has no solution. That's how we'd write that. And I should have, back with example 3a, I should have mentioned that, that you always want to be mindful of the domain. And for 3a, the domain is that x can't be zero because a zero for x would give us a zero in the denominator. For 3b, x, the, the domain is any value for x except a negative one. Uh, solve and determine whether the equation is an identity, conditional, or inconsistent equation. If I solve this equation, I've got 5x plus 9 equals 9x plus 9 minus 4x. Combining like terms on the right gives us 5x plus 9. And then if I subtract 5x from both sides, notice what happens. I get the statement that 9 equals 9. Well, that's not an, an example, right? Or, or an answer. It doesn't tell me what, what does x equal. Well, what this means, when I get a true statement, what that means is 
I can replace the X with anything, pick any number you want, and it's going to come out being a true statement. And that's what we would call an identity. So we would say that 5x plus 9 equals 9 times the quantity of x plus 1 minus 4x is an identity because we get a true statement. No matter what we put in for x, try it. Pick, pick three or four different numbers. Try putting those numbers in for x. You'll find that it always works out. You could pick any real number for x and your answer would be correct. So we could say that there are an infinite number of solutions to this. We could say that the answer is all real numbers. Any real number could be used for x. When we do this next example, if we subtract 8x from both sides, we'd get uh, 2x plus 3 equals 3. And then when I subtract 3 from both sides, I'd get 2x equals 0. And then when I divide both sides by 2, I get that x equals 0. And when x equals 0, if I um, put a 0 in for x, we get a true statement. So that 0 for x is nothing special. The solution is x equals 0. So what we'd say about that is it's just a conditional equation. What that means is there are solutions out there, but it's not like the identity where every number is a solution. It's conditional. The equation is balanced under the condition that x equals 0. Let's look at one more example like this. Uh, for, or from from this section, this number five, the formula C equals one and nine tenths x plus one hundred twenty five and five tenths can be used to model model cost after twenty ten uh, x years after twenty ten of what cost at of what cost one hundred dollars in nineteen ninety nine. Use the model to determine in which year. The cost will be 160 and for what cost uh, $100 in 1999. We'll see several problems like this, so it's important that you understand this problem. So really what we're looking at is inflation, an inflation rate. So if something was $100 in 1999, what year is it going to cost $160? So in other words, when C is uh, 160, so C is the cost X years after 2010. So when C is 160, uh, find the number of years, find X. So I could do this by replacing C with 160, I'd have 160 equals 1.9 plus 125.5. Oh, I left the x off. 1.9x. 160 equals 1 to 9, time, 9 tenths times x plus 125.5. And now I'm simply going to solve this equation. So I'll subtract 125.5. from both sides and 100, 160 minus 125 and 5 tenths is 34.5. Feel free to use a calculator for that calculation, by the way, is equal to 1.9x. Now I'm going to divide both sides by 1.9, 1 and 9 tenths, 34.5. If you use the calculator, that 34.5 is still on the calculator. So I could just do divided by 1. I'll use to clear it and rewrite it, right? So I'd get that x equals 18.1578, and it keeps going, right? Or I could say that x is approximately 18. Well, the question didn't ask us what x equaled. It asked us to find what year, determine the year. So if x 
is representing the years after 2010, then 18 years after 2010 would be 2010 plus 18 or the year 2028. So what I could interpret from this problem is if something was $100 in 1999, that same item is going to be close to $160 in 2028 if inflation rate continues at the same, uh, following the same pattern that it's currently on. So the answer to the year is 2028. Well, I hope that these examples have been helpful to you in better understanding the content. Please let me know if you have any questions about the content or any questions about the different examples that were worked out.